Hi, everybody. My name is James Densmore. Uh, really excited to be here today to talk about two of my favorite things, open source software and the modern data stack. Uh, before I get started, uh, there's a QR code on the screen. You can uh, scan that. You can get into the Discord channel where there's a live chat. So I'll give you a second, and then I will get going. All right. So uh, first, a little bit about me. Uh, I'm currently the Director of Data Infrastructure for Business Intelligence at HubSpot. Um, what that means is I lead the engineering organization that is the central data team uh, for HubSpot for internal analytics. So uh, I'll get into some data team structure and things uh, around the modern data stack later. Uh, but what my team does is uh, we have data engineers, data warehouse engineers, and software engineers um, really focused on the infrastructure and platform that analytics engineers and data analysts are building off of. So, um, you know, data pipelines for uh, data ingestion, orchestration, uh, as well as some data warehousing for kind of core data assets in the company. Uh, again, talk a little bit about sort of that distributed data team model later on, uh, but it's a lot of fun. I'm also the founder and consultant at a company called Data Liftoff, which I started a few years ago. I did that full time for a while. Uh, now I do it on the side uh, when I have some time, uh, working full time, of course. And then uh, I'm also the author of a book that came out this year called Data Pipelines Pocket Reference. You'll see the, uh, the friendly animal logo there. Uh, it's an O'Reilly book. If you haven't checked it out, I'd love if you did. Give me some feedback. Uh, it's been a lot of fun uh, writing it and hearing from people who have read it. So um, please do. And with that, first I want to talk about what the modern data stack is. So uh, you know, we're going to talk about it a lot over the next few days. And I took this graphic right off the conference homepage. So hopefully you've all seen this. And you're going to get to hear from all these different uh, open source products uh, and, and projects along the way. But when I think about the, uh, the modern data stack, uh, I think about all these different pieces, you know, collecting data, bringing it into a warehouse, transforming it, orchestrating all of those jobs that are doing so, visualizing it, and then, you know, more recently syncing uh, that data for operational use uh, out of your data warehouse. So I'm going to go through a little bit about you know, how this all fits together and how open source plays such a, a big role in the modern data stack as we go through. But before that, I'm going to back up a little um, because getting to what we consider now the modern data stack in 2021, it's taken some time to get here. Uh, so I'm going to go back about 10, 15 years and talk about how we got to the point where this is even all possible and why there's such an explosion of great tools uh, that are coming out now in this stack. So going back, you know, probably, I guess, you know, 10 to 12 years now, uh, most of us, if, if you were around during that time in analytics, you were building data warehouses most likely off of a, uh, a row store database. So an OLTP database such as MySQL, Postgres, um, and so on. And, and those are great databases for application development. Um, and But that's what was around. So we sort of had to work with uh, row store. At the time, I, I would guess that most of us, at least myself at that time, didn't really think about that so much, right? We just said, this is a, a database. I can write SQL. I can build tables and write scripts. That's great. I can, you know, uh, build a data warehouse and I can report off that and, and do all these great things. Unfortunately, it doesn't, it wasn't designed for that. Um, and it makes it harder to do the analytics work that we all do today. So uh, this is probably the most technical uh, slide in the entire presentation. So I'll dive a little bit into it, um, but it does get a little less technical from here. Uh, so Rowbase, um, just as the name would, would uh, you know, lead you to believe, data is stored row by row on disk. So in this example, it looks like a customer record. Of course, uh, this has a social security number, not a real one, but uh, you, you probably never want to store that in free text. But as an example, you know, you have a customer record. Uh, each record is stored uh, in a block, if it fits in a single block, on disk, so together. This is really optimal for applications that are going to read and write you know, small sets of records or, and likely either all or most columns in a record. It's very efficient to get to all of that at once. So you can see in the example there, you know, a single row is kind of highlighted on block two of that disk. Um, you know, if you want to read that and write back to it, it's great. It's all right there. It's very efficient. However, when you think about the tables that you're building in a data warehouse today, they're very wide and often very deep. So if you want to read an entire record for, you know, uh, you know, just like exploration, you're probably fine, although it may be wide enough that it, it spans multiple disk blocks. But 
you're also not typically reading or writing a single record. You're doing a lot of bulk work. You're either bulk loading data in, you're you know selecting a large amount of data and then aggregating, um, you know whether it be summing up or averaging, you know joining massive data sets. But you're often doing it just a few columns together at a time. So that's where column or store databases came in. You see the bottom image there, same table, uh, same records, but we're storing data column down. So in this case, social security numbers all stored together, names, ages, et cetera. And so if you think about writing a query where you're looking at instead of one record, maybe tens of thousands or millions of records, and you wanna get the average age uh, you know, for uh, these customers, now you only have to read down you know, that age column and those are all stored together on disk. Furthermore, this makes it easier for uh, data distribution across many nodes. When you think about the fact that we can you know, cluster and store data uh, by column rather than row for analytics purposes, you can kind of pick and choose you know, which data needs to be together uh, and then break it up in a more efficient way. So that was a big change. Um, and it's something that all the data warehouses we're using today uh, our columnar store for data warehousing for this reason. The next thing that happened was, believe it or not, when that first happened, all those columnar databases uh, that we were all working with were on-prem. Uh, so that uh, really fancy looking thing on the left there, that is a Netiza Twinfin appliance. Um, I actually worked with one of these. It, it was one of the early, um, you know, columnar sort of MPP or massively parallel processing uh, data warehouses, and it was a total game changer. Performance-wise, you could do things that you just couldn't do on those more traditional row-based databases. The downside was you literally had to get those appliances into your server room, set up, running, uh, maintain them, and if you wanted to scale up, you literally have to order more hardware and put it in place. So really cool appliance, very expensive. Um, you know, Not every company could afford them, not every company could deal with maintaining them and certainly very you know, inflexible as far as scaling either up or down. So uh, you know, learned a lot from those, but what came out of that a few years later are cloud data warehouses. So the first one I worked with was Redshift. You know, now we have Snowflake and BigQuery and others. That change was massive. You know, that took that same technology, made it affordable, accessible, scalable, and you know, really open to a lot more companies working with such databases and data warehouses. So if you think back to, you know, I know now it seems crazy to even consider that kind of hardware investment. Um, but, you know, at the time, data teams are just kind of coming into, you know, um, I guess, prominence at companies. Um, so you're not necessarily sitting there with a large budget to start with. And now you're saying, I have to go out and, and buy physical hardware. I need to upgrade it and maintain it. You know, that was very difficult. Uh, and to move to the cloud, it was more, hey, I can spend, you know, maybe a few hundred dollars a month to try something out, prototype it, get it up and running, scale it up, scale it down. Um, you know, not a massive commitment financially. Uh, that really opened the door to a lot of what we see today on the modern data stack, which is, you know, new companies right out of the gate building um, on these, you know, very high powered, data warehouses at an affordable cost. So what all that led to was this big evolution, which uh, really kind of happened behind the scenes for a lot of people, but now uh, seems a bit more obvious. And that's that transition from ETL to ELT. So uh, ETL, extract, transform, load, you know, kind of the three major steps in a, a data pipeline, if you zoom way out, you know, extracting data from the source, loading it into your warehouse, and transforming it. And it, the, the matter of order of those, those steps um, really sets the tone for what your data stack looks like and what your data team looks like. So those warehouses, uh, those column or store, you know, you know, data warehouses that you could uh, distribute across many nodes allowed us to switch the order uh, a bit. So, you know, instead of extracting data and then having to do a lot of transform before loading it into a more traditional database for performance reasons and storage reasons, you could skip that transform and put that at the end. And what that does is it gives data engineers the ability to focus on the first part, the EL or data ingestion, data integration, whatever you want to call it, 
they can focus there and get the data in into a warehouse and maybe a bit more of a raw form um, and, and certainly not have to cut out you know, and pre-aggregate or anything like that for performance. These modern data warehouses can handle both the depth and the width of those data sets. And so out of that, you know, the transform, and when we talk about transform here, just as a note, there's, there's still some technically some transform in that EL, but not business contextual transform. So, you know, shaping data a bit, cleaning it up, deduping it, sure. Uh, that definitely happens during that extract and load now. Um, I consider this like a lowercase t versus the uppercase t in ELT, which is where uh, data analysts fit in. Um, they are modeling data using things like PVT um, to create data models and actually you know, derive analytical value from that data. They can completely own that. And you see this separation of data engineering and a data analyst who you know, has sort of grown into the analytics engineering role that really, to me, only became possible with ELT. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about analytics engineers. I'm sure you'll hear more about it in other talks. But you know, that role of a data analyst really becoming empowered to own their data, their data modeling, um, using you know, more of a software engineering mentality and how they work, really became possible first from Columnar Store, then Cloud, and then this sort of evolution to ELT. Those analytics engineers, when I say they're becoming more like software engineers, it's because of the way they work and the tools they use. And some of these tools are very familiar to all of you that are working with open source, um, using things like Git and you know, other deployment tools that are very popular. Analytics engineers have gone from you know, the data analysts of a few years ago that were very stuck waiting on engineering a lot to get their data, kind of get it like preformed to deploy it to production. Um, they've been empowered uh, in amazing ways, as you'll see with some of the, the different tools and open source projects you know, over the next few days. Um, and they are, they're working a lot like software engineers. I started my, my career as a software engineer. When I moved into data, it was like, we didn't have the same tooling. It was, you know, there were companies uh, that just pushed things right to production. There was limited or no version control. Um, you know, just that whole like, uh, concept of unit testing was not there. Maybe people wrote some data validation tests, but they weren't testing their code, uh, you know, as if they were a software engineer. All that is now happening at a lot of companies. Uh, and there's a lot of great open source projects that are enabling that. Um, and I also think that analytics engineering role is growing up so fast. Uh, and it's so exciting to see how empowered they are in an organization uh, because they do know the data um, better than anyone else. Uh, at least in contextual sense. And so how does open source fit into all this? Well, like I said, you know, by splitting out, you know, ELT into EL and T, uh, it's not quite that simple, but it does allow open source projects to kind of come in and fill different gaps and different needs. So data engineers are getting their own tools. They're starting to, to not have to customize everything themselves or, you know, build on top of a single kind of like enterprise uh, platform. So a lot of tools for both data ingestion as well as orchestration, you know, all the different jobs that have to run and, uh, you know, dependencies upstream, downstream, coordination, some great orchestration frameworks in the open source world, as well as data ingestion frameworks. And those analytics engineers, like I mentioned, you know, they are now, you know, moving out of the, you know, just in a dashboarding tool and moving into being able to truly build out data assets in the warehouse with some of these transformation tools and frameworks. Uh, and open source is great because you can kind of pick and choose which ones make sense for your team. And then finally, like I said, at the end of uh, ELT is sort of that, what I'm calling ELT plus, if you'll call it uh, reverse ETL, operational analytics, you name it. But as you're deriving analytical value from data, uh, you do need to sometimes get that into your operational systems. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, and where that's trending later. Uh, but that's empowering those that know the data, those analytics engineers, uh, to get the data to where it needs to go after the warehouse, which is a, a relatively new concept. So uh, when you're thinking about open source, like I said, it, you're no longer stuck in that sort of like single enterprise analytics platform uh, mindset anymore. You know, it may be not even 10 years ago, uh, certainly when you were at a company of any you know, meaningful size, 
a lot of times the question is, which BI platform do we go with? And people tried to build just about everything off of that single platform. What's been great about this explosion of open source activity in the analytics space, is you can pick and choose the tools you want at each point in your pipeline. So all the way from data ingestion, orchestration, you know, kind of cleaning data, testing, observability, transformation, uh, data visualization, whatever it is, there's a great uh, set of you know, open source projects popping up and you can pick and choose. You're not locked into this single ecosystem and vendor. Um, and from you know, someone who reads a data team and makes purchasing decisions, I can tell you that is uh, a big relief and something that it just feels lower risk. You're able to experiment and not lock yourself into a long-term uh, relationship with one single enterprise vendor. And now, in addition to that, it, it makes that build versus buy no longer that binary choice. Um, I, I've been asked this question you know, several times from people like, where do you sit on build versus buy? And my answer more recently has been, it, it's not a, like a choice, it's both now. You know, you are, uh, a lot of us are using a lot of commercial tools and that's great. Snowflake, Redshift, whatever data warehouse you wanna use, go for it, right? Um, and then, you know, layering open source along with other commercial products throughout your, your stack, that's fine. Um, I have a picture of an old, you know, I, this goes <laughs> way, way back, much further than that 10 year span, but, you know, uh, making a mixtape. I could have put a Spotify playlist, but I, you know, something about physical media uh, really appeals to me. But just that, that feeling of being able to customize and make something that is like really fits someone or some event, right? Like that's how I, I think about the modern data stack is putting things together, building your own stack from what's out there. And open source is just, you know, an amazing way to kind of pick and choose and then customize as we'll talk about a little bit later. And the last thing I want to mention too, is sometimes when people hear open source, they go, oh, you know, we're completely on our own here. That's not necessarily true. Um, you know, there are certainly uh, enterprise versions, uh, supported versions of open source tools. Uh, there's also great communities around open source to support. So it's not something that is just, you know, here's some code go run with it and now you're completely on your own. That's not true. It never really has been with open source, but even more so uh, on the, you know, in the analytics sense, um, all these different products uh, that are coming out of open source, you know, do have great support and communities around it if that's the direction you wanna go. So basically you can build your own uh, stack. And I think that's a really exciting opportunity. So just one example of that, um, you know, kind of that customizing situation you're in um, so at HubSpot, as one example, a lot of our data, most of our data, the majority of it that we are loading into our warehouse comes from internal sources. It's not true at every company. Um, you know, we've been around for a while. We're a software company. So we just happen to create a lot of our own data. Um, and so if you start to think about how you ingest that data, what, what, how you might want to get it in, it's very difficult to kind of go off the shelf and get it all loaded in. It's also very difficult to just continue to customize uh, and, and repeat over and over again, how you're loading data in. And this is common with a lot of companies. When I was consulting uh, even more than I am now, you know, talking to different companies, hearing their, their problems, hey, we have so many different data sources. Some are supported by, you know, common ingestion frameworks, some aren't. Um, you know, we have engineers who are just too busy to build these things, they break, all that kind of stuff. And that's why you're seeing this explosion of, you know, data ingestion uh, tools and frameworks popping up. And with open source, you can customize. So if you do have a lot of custom sources as well as third-party sources, uh, there's you know these frameworks that you can build off rather than having to start on your own. Um, but also, uh, you know, you kind of come in with a set of connectors that others in the community have built. Some of those are reusable. Some of those are extendable, um, and you can certainly uh, build your own and also contribute back to that project uh, and, and kind of build up that ecosystem. So when we're thinking about, you know, the limitations of, you know, commercial products, um, sometimes they're there, sometimes they're not, but with open source, you do have that ability to always extend and also integrate um, with the rest of your, your data stack. So whatever other uh, things you put on your mixtape, you can kind of put these things together and customize, extend, and then again, you know, contribute that back to the project for others that it might be doing something similar. This is a very like sort of like the complete non-technical side of things. Um, there's there is a culture that you want to create when you are building a data team. Um, true with any team in a company, 
Uh, but data teams right now, you know, it is a, a young practice. Uh, everyone seems to be hiring like crazy, as all of you probably know, based on your LinkedIn inboxes. It's, it's a time where you really need to set yourself apart. And I found that open source really does have more of a community, uh, you know, sort of nature to it and really a great vibe on a data team. So you think about, uh, and I, I ran this experiment. I talked to people who work for me. I talked to people I know in the industry. And I said, you know, what, what products are your engineers, your data engineers, your analysts, your software engineers who are working in data? What are they really passionate about? Like, what are the things right now? Uh, and just about every example I got was an open source um, product. Not all of them, certainly some commercial uh, products do a great job of community building. Um, but uh, the number of open source ones was staggering. So you can try this, you know, what, what Slack communities are they members of? Um, you know, what meetups do they go to? What conferences do they go to? Uh, what do they chat about on Twitter? Who do they connect with? There's a lot of open source in there. And that is something that when you are posting jobs, um, you know, kind of creating that data team culture, you can call out these different things. You know, we work with uh, this open source project. This, you know, this is on our stack. Um, you can become members of those communities. Uh, I spend time in some of those, those Slack communities that are very active. And it's not just for recruiting, but for, for learning, um, kind of becoming a part of a bigger data organization outside of your organization. Uh, a lot of these projects have done such a great job of creating that. And then, you know, I mentioned this before about giving you know, giving back uh, to open source. There's, there's that ability for engineers not only to solve for themselves and kind of, you know, not feel locked in, um, but as they are extending and customizing on top of an open source product, they can give back, right? That could be, you know, submitting a PR, um, maybe it's a bug fix, maybe it's a feature. Um, it could also be, you know, coming to a conference to speak, to share knowledge, uh, your company might sponsor, you know, some of these, these different projects. There's a lot of different ways, but again, it's a, it's a level of engagement and learning that your engineers and your analysts get that you don't get necessarily uh, when you are fully on the, you know, buying uh, an off the shelf product. So again, your team might be different. The ones I've talked to really get excited about open source. And I, I you know, encourage you to go out and talk to your peers and your manager and, and those that work for you, whatever it may be, and find out, you know, where are they spending their time um, and where are they getting excited about, you know, different products. And I, I bet you there's a lot of open source in there. So I mentioned this a little bit uh, earlier on, but, you know, ELT has been that like big, big thing, right? You know, uh, and a lot of the modern data stack is focused on getting data from a system, getting it into a warehouse, transforming it, visualizing it, making sense of it, you know, creating sort of this analytical value. That's been great. And that has empowered a lot of different businesses to make better decisions. Um, but where are things kind of like just starting to go? And in and, uh, and that, to me, there's, there's a few things I'll talk about at the very end, sort of like further down the line. But right now, what is, I'm seeing happening um, and we're seeing uh, different open source products and commercial ones pop up around is a sense of operational analytics. Um, again, some people are referring to this as reverse ETL because it's data coming from your warehouse back to production systems. Um, there's a lot of different names for it, but you know, I like to think of it as the, the value that you are creating, that analytical value in your warehouse can do more than just power internal reporting and analysis and data science and all that. It can go back into uh, various production applications, you know, workflows. Uh, and this is something that quite honestly scared me a few years ago when I saw it happening. I think it still scares a lot of people today. The warehouse was never seen as like a production system, right? It was never uh, sitting on the same uh, thing as sort of the application databases uh, as far as infrastructure or uptime or monitoring and all that. And that might still be true in, in many regards. I don't, you know, I personally don't recommend hooking an application directly down to your data warehouse, you know, for live querying. Um, it's not really set up for that. However, there are a lot of cases where analytics engineers are creating or data scientists are creating value from the data in the warehouse. And then that data needs to go power something in your business. So maybe a marketing email workflow or something that's, you know, sitting in front of a salesperson uh, live on their application as they're, you know, on the phone with a customer. In the past, this has happened a couple of different ways. Sometimes an analyst will, 
you know, maybe build a model that has some kind of, um, you know, uh, value score or something, and we want to give that for weed scoring to sales. They might export that as a CSV, get it uploaded into whatever, you know, CRM salespeople are working with or other tools. And that was the process. Other times, um, and this is what we've, we've seen in the last couple of years, people will find different ways to automate that process of getting data from a warehouse, uh, you know, to those operational systems. The problem is it wasn't being done in a, a standardized, consistent, governable way, and things can get really out of control. Someone will be in one of those, you know, production tools and go, how do we get this score? Or how do I know, like, how did this email list get generated? Um, maybe the person who built it is no longer at the company, you know, all these different things that it was sort of just behind the scenes. And so um, this is something I always tell people, if, if you're not doing anything about operational analytics, you're not using any tools, many of which are open source or, or not putting some kind of governance in place, doesn't mean it's not happening. It's probably happening and you just don't know about it or you just don't have the time to focus on it, um, but you really should start to take the time to focus. Uh, so I believe this is a good thing. Um, you know, I, I do believe that the analysts and the analytics engineers and the data scientists who are producing this analytical value know the most about it and we should empower them to get it to where it needs to go. You know, not have them blocked waiting on engineering or exporting, you know, flat files and sending them around or whatever else that, that might be done. They are the right people. They know the data. They understand the models they've created, the metrics they've created. You know, make sure we're getting them the tools they need to properly do this uh, and go beyond ELT into that, you know, sort of next phase of the warehouse actually being a source um, the two other systems, which again is, is sort of a, a, a concept that was just not uh, well established not that long ago, but it's great to see this kind of coming into the modern data stack. The other thing that is really happening right now that um, is one of those things that whether you like it or not, it's, it's probably an issue you need to focus on um, is data protection and governance. And I say whether you like it or not, because in the past, this has always felt like a nice to have, you know, data protection was seen as like, well, we need to make sure that our network is secure um, and that, you know, we don't, um, we don't share a social security number, uh, you know, in uh, free text or something. We don't have that in there and people seeing it reports. That's all, you know, fairly obvious at this point, but we are now at the point where there is a lot of um, legislation, whether it be GDPR or something else, um, customers also, they care more. They will ask, you know, how is my data protected? Who's seeing this data? What are you using my data for? Um, you know, are you using it for me or for your benefit? Um, you know, those kind of things, those are not nice to haves anymore. Those are the world we live in. And so thinking about data protection and data privacy uh, is something where I feel open source gives you a chance to own more of your data where there is some stuff that you might want to keep in house. Um, and you want to really understand how you're protecting it, how you're governing it. You know, a lot of the, the open source, uh, you know, projects that are out there are focused on that. So, you know, people who are, are not as comfortable sending that off to a third party anymore. How can I own that? Um, same thing with data governance. Um, you know, when we're talking about observing our data, you know, how's it doing? Is it valid? Uh, how do I find things? You know, that is something that there's just so many different open source products that have taken us from a world where, you know, sort of that old method of, you know, documenting your tables and writing manual tests and, uh, you know, data dictionaries that were never kept, kept up to date, uh, that doesn't get by anymore. You know, as I've talked about ELT and the empowerment of analytics engineers, it's not surprising that we're creating more and more assets in our data warehouses every day. Some of those are powering operational. Uh, you know, components on the infrastructure. You know, th those old ways of, you know, manually uh, observing and testing and documenting data just don't work anymore. Um, it's a good thing we're creating more, in my opinion, but the downside is how do we find it all? How do we keep track of it? Um, how do we know when things go wrong, right? We, we can't uh, expect every, you know, manual test uh, to be written and maintained and, and monitored, right? They're I've, I've been around uh, places where you have, you do have good tests and alerts, but they're going out to, you know, Slack channels or email lists that are not well monitored. All of this needs to be really kind of pulled together. Um, and data governance, I think, is going to be something that we're going to continue to see 
more and more investment in, um, as well as data protection. Because again, we're, we're at a different stage now. Uh, we've grown up as a, an industry. Uh, it's time to get really serious about investing here. So looking into the future a little bit, and I, I'm always uh, reluctant to give any kind of bold predictions for the future, uh, especially in a talk that people can watch years from now. So um, I'll be careful, but you know, seeing some of the trends now um, and how open source is playing into those, it's really exciting. And I think we are uh, today and throughout the next few days sitting on some of the bleeding edge of where this is all going. So one thing, I, and I've, I've brought this up several times, you know, especially with the ELT and the birth of the analytics engineer, but just empowering those with the domain knowledge of the data more and more so uh, is going to continue. It's not going to slow down, in my opinion. So as analytics engineers become more and more empowered, uh, you know, with open source tools, with commercial tools, just with their own skill sets, um, and as they work more like software engineers and can, you know, kind of take their own destiny into their own hands a bit more, um, I do think that autonomy and independence, A, is a good thing, and B, will continue to accelerate. Um, I mentioned the decentralized data org. So this uh, this little you know diagram at the bottom kind of represents what I mean by that, where that orange dot in the middle is a team like mine, a central data org that is not focused on a single domain of data, marketing data, sales, et cetera, but is focused on the infrastructure and tooling, uh, orchestration, you know, all that that empowers all of those other dots, which represent data teams embedded in different parts of the organization um, to run with their own data. You know, they understand that data. We want to empower them, but we want to do it in a way uh, that is governable, that they can work together. You know, marketing might create something in the data warehouse that sales wants to use. How do we make sure that that is supported and done in a way that uh, puts them both uh, in a place that allows them to maintain that uh, and understand what it is? So the central data team really providing uh, that, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute. I, I think that's a big part of it. The last part here is this starts to make, you know, we've talked, I've, I've heard this used, uh, this, this kind of phrase used a lot over the years, which is data as a first class citizen. And I think one of the reasons why it's been so challenging for a lot of organizations to really live that is data teams were locked into a single org and either put under engineering or IT or marketing or finance. I've seen it all over. And so the rest of the organization just doesn't you know, it, it's harder for them to see and buy into the value of data when what they're doing is thinking of that as a service organization where they can go ask for a report or a number or a dashboard. They're not living it every day. I think with this empowerment of, uh, you know, those data analysts and analytics engineers and data scientists that are embedded in different departments, that does start to get us closer to that first class citizen. You know, marketing not only needs dashboards, they can create them. They don't not, you know, they're not out there asking another team. It doesn't feel as far away. So they are going to invest um, again with that central data team supporting that and that infrastructure. Uh, but really it becomes part of every department's uh, goals and needs and they are empowered, you know, to do more on their own. I, I think that's where we'll see more and more of this, you know, data really becoming um, of high value and top of mind for a lot of leaders across the company not just data leaders. So a little bit more about those central data orgs. Like I said, I, I truly believe in this, this model and this concept. Um, and what I really think that is the difference between the central data org of yesteryear and the, the central data org of today is we need to think of ourselves as enablers, not gatekeepers. It was always, you know, protect the data. Um, you know, what do the analysts need? Tell us exactly what you need and we'll build out something for you. Um, you know, taking tickets, you know, moving from ticket takers to more of a vision oriented product organization as a central data team uh, is really important because, again, all of those different kind of satellite organizations, if you will, not only need to build off of the, the core infrastructure, but need to work together. And there has to be a, a central org that is in a position to make all of that possible, both technically, uh, but as well as organizationally, you know, ensuring that they're uh, those teams are talking to each other and that uh, everything is done in at least a similar way on a similar platform uh, so that there is some standardization. So uh, I'm a big believer in this model. Uh, a few things about the model, though, I, I think beyond just being enablers and not, you know, being that service or a gatekeeper uh, is really hiring the right people. I, I truly believe in hiring data engineers 
who look like software engineers uh, in skill set, and actually hiring software engineers as well to both you know take a lot of these open source uh, projects and, and integrate them into your data stack, um, as well as integrate with the rest of your organization's tooling. Um, sometimes building out your own tooling, right? There, there might not be a product out there. You might start your own open source project out of some of this work. But if we don't have that capability on the central data team, it's that sort of waiting on engineering feeling again, where ah, we can do everything in SQL, like we can get you know a new warehouse spun up, but like we, we can't integrate that product or we can't um, you know build out uh, some front end that you might need. Uh, we have to go wait for the software engineering team who is typically very busy building out you know your organization's product or some other internal project. Uh, so I'm a big believer of those central data teams, not only having data warehouse uh, you know, people and data engineers who in the past have been a little bit less like software engineers and more you know, tools oriented to having that full software engineering capability in that central org. And then again, I, I think the focus on the core, right? So it's, it's not about building out um, you know, individual uh, dashboards or reports or any of those or even models in the warehouse that are specific to a single part of the organization. I think the more you decentralize and you empower those organizations or those departments in your organization, the more you can focus on those core assets. So for example, every part of the company might care about the revenue that you're generating as a company. And if they each have their own version of that, um, which I've seen many, many times, uh, there's a lot of ways to define revenue and, and different cuts. You don't want marketing and sales and customer support having different numbers there. Uh, and then finance looking at it going, nope, that's not what we use. So I do think there, there is an opportunity for central data teams, not just to be software engineers and data engineers, but also that data warehousing component of building out some of those kind of core assets or abstraction layers on top of some of the raw data that a lot of different teams are gonna use. And you do want a single source of truth and understanding as well as ownership of that in the warehouse. So I think it can be both. Um, I don't think it's it's just moving fully to software engineering. I, I think we can we can do both of those at the same time, but also make sure you know we're we're not just going back to creating that silo uh, and that gate. So open source, how, again, kind of wrapping it up. How does it all fit in? I do think commercial products will still play a big part. Uh, I'm not naive enough to say open source is going to, to take over everything. But I have seen, especially in the last few years in analytics, just an explosion of amazing open source products and projects. Um, again, you're going to see a lot over the next few days. There's a lot out there. Um, there's so much energy and engagement. Uh, we talked about the team culture uh, that it creates. It's, it's amazing right now. Um, and coming from software engineering and seeing you know, open source over the years, uh, I've been a big believer in it. It's been very successful in software engineering for a reason. I don't expect anything less with analytics. In fact, I think we're even have a more unique opportunity because we are very young in this. We're just starting out and what this data stack looks like. And it's starting with so much open source activity from the beginning that there's a real opportunity there. That said, I know this is a little cheesy, but it really is up to us. You know, we have to look in the mirror and sort of define this future a bit. You know, we are the, the folks that are, are doing this. We're implementing these. We're building these uh, open source projects. We're contributing to them. We're supporting them. Um, it's not going to happen without us. So all of these predictions about how data teams will be set up, how the technology will grow, the adoption of open source, um, you know, the, the sort of growth of the analytics engineering, uh, as well as data engineering functions, that doesn't happen without us. So really excited to, to kind of see how this thing grows over the next few years. Really excited to speak today. Uh, it's been great. So thank you so much. And uh, please do reach out. I'd love to hear from all of you. Thank you.